Hello, welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about season four, episode 20, titled A Bullet for Crockett. Finally happened. High fives all around, people. Crockett finally got his. No? No? No one, no one agrees? <laughs> How okay. dare you? How dare you, sir? <laughs> At this table. <laughs> I could have sworn someone promised him this bullet. <laughs> I know. That it had a, like his name on it or something. If only there was an episode where they could look back at all the times where <laughs> something like that could have happened. I mean, that would be great, but. Yeah, just. And then what all are the odds? Like he's done something with one of the members of ICE, except for Zito. Don't do anything with Zito. Have everyone else on the show, but don't do a flashback with Zito. Well, I mean, they did have a flashback with Zito. It just didn't. <laughs> he just didn't do anything in the flashback. <laughs> just wasn't moving. <laughs> it originally premiered on April fifteenth, nineteen eighty-eight. It is written by Dick Wolf. No surprises there. It is directed by Donald Gold, who is also the co-producer of one hundred and eleven episodes of Miami Vice. This is the only episode he directed. So he was the schmo that got stuffed into the editing room that had to go find all these clips. Pretty much. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. As we mentioned, or have hinted at, this is the clip show, the only clip show in Miami Vice's history. And for a clip show, that's okay. Yeah, it was pretty good. I thought this was going to be have more of an impact at the end, but then he woke up. So I guess everything's fine. (laughs) (laughs) And I can think of no better episode for us to land on on episode 100. This is the 100th episode of Go With The Heat, Pals. It was meant to be. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For the 100th hundredth episode, we give you the greatest clip show of a clip show. (laughs) (laughs) We have clip show inception happening here. We are going to do a clip show of the clip show. Of us talking about the clips. <laughs> and then we're going to talk more about the clips. It's clips about clips and us conversing about the clips. But also think about this. It could have been in your own clip show that you do at the end of the season. <laughs> yes. So it's like a, I don't even know how many times over. So yes, we're going to have a lot of fun with this episode. We are so happy we made it to episode 100. Thank you to everyone who enjoys the show and everyone who enjoys Miami Vice. <laughs> and if you listen and you don't enjoy, thanks too. No, I'm just <laughs> Thank you too. Thank you. Keep sending your nickels. <laughs> John's almost got 20 cents. <laughs> yes, we will take your nickels and throw them at John. Please mail them or support us on Patreon. If you support us on Patreon, like a dollar, a dollar per month. That's all that we're asking for. You give us a dollar per month, I'll convert that into nickels and I will throw them at John when I see him. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to break down this one, even though it is a clip show. So we're going to do clips about the clips. And we're going to have a lot of fun with this one. And we're just so happy we made it to episode 100. And we're staring down the beginning of season five and the final sprint to the end on Miami Vice. So speaking mm-hmm. of a sprint, let's get to the opening in this episode when Crockett tries to sprint his way in front of a bullet. <laughs> 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 let's go talk about this week's episode. So we open up in typical Vice fashion. Bill Collins is playing. They're in a smoky alley. The duo are walking with intent that they are going to buy some damn drugs. This time it's going to happen for real. (laughs) Our entire season has been opens of drug dealers or stings. And this just continues it and made me think of when I was watching this that Dick Wolf was like, oh, wait a minute. This stuff happened before season three. There was two yeah. whole seasons that <laughs> happened. <laughs> Maybe we should do some of that stuff. <laughs> They're walking down I don't this- know about you guys, but this entire open was distracted because I was waiting for the drum solo to kick in. <laughs> just count. I, By the way, opening better make it to that drum solo. You better not cut this off before the drum solo. <laughs> Oh, exactly. And I never realized how far into the song that drum solo really is. They walk up to two men who are, and they're going to buy 10 keys from them. And one of them's got him strapped to his body like he's a suicide cocaine bomber or something. (laughs) (laughs) They also have the arm support of the greatest mullet band in the history of mullets. (laughs) They were so good with their mullets and mustaches. They probably meet up at Comic-Con. So it's like, Mullet group, Miami number 71946. 
Yeah, they were very generic looking mullets, though. <laughs> this thing starts to go very vile uh, after the mullet gang pulls their weapons on them. Vice calls out their backup, and it turns into a good old Vice shoot-off. It was actually more like shooting fish in a barrel, right? Because all the police were up on top of the wall. And they're just like mowing down the people down in the pit. Oh. Oh, yeah, they're just massacre dealers. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they won't be what making kind of another mullet this? convention. <laughs> no, <laughs> they're not making it to the second annual one for sure. <laughs> and then Loco or Ricky, whatever you want to call him. Ugly is what I would call him. <laughs> <laughs> the main dealer, he gets away, jumps into his car with his girlfriend who drives away. And we not only get a shootout and a busted drug deal but also a car chase in this open with Phil Collins. Doesn't get any better than this, pals. And also two different hairstyles for Crockett. <laughs> <laughs> he has short hair in the beginning and then miraculously grows to a long mullet in the next clip. I'm, I'm suspicious on how that works. The continuity of hair is never important <laughs> in Miami. Apparently not in the driving scene. <laughs> they've done that several times. It was... He was driving so fast that his hair literally pulled, was flowing in the wind and got longer. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that would have made it better for if it went back to being short. <laughs> Switches around. By the way, the Porsche is doing pretty good getting away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, I don't know. I don't even know why they stopped. I don't at the know train why they station. stopped at the train station. That seemed like a very poor decision. <laughs> of course, the train's late again. <laughs> <laughs> they hop the turnstiles to do all our quick after them they run up the top of the stairs they hold their position and are firing down at the duo as they are trying to go up the stairs sunny runs around the back goes up a different flight of stairs when he comes up the top of the stairs he shoots and kills ricky and while they're going over to check on the body tubs comes up the stairs they're checking on ricky's body his girlfriend angel picks up the gun aims it at sunny fires Hits him square in the chest. Sonny goes down, falls onto the train tracks right when the train's coming. He goes up, though. He <laughs> jumps up. <laughs> you're, and you're like, he just jump off the platform altogether? <laughs> He's on, he lands on the train tracks and then poor Tubbs goes on after him on the train tracks. And a train comes and Tubbs is holding him, like cradling him while the train goes by. <laughs> it's like the saddest thing. <laughs> so... I feel like this kind of Crockett's fault. Follow me here. <laughs> he comes up behind the guy and shoots him. And then he goes over and just kicks the gun to the side. Mind you, it was the guy's girlfriend that was driving the Porsche. She's the one that was the getaway driver. She's an accomplice. She's not like some kidnapped victim or so. She's an accomplice to this guy. <laughs> so he doesn't secure the weapon. He doesn't secure the other perp. Instead, he's checking for her poles. He doesn't wait for his partner. Completely turns back on her. And so, yeah, she picks the guns up, shoots him. Because he falls behind the train, Tubbs can't go catch her. She gets away. You know, and, and Tubbs got to jump down by the train, which... Yeah, but you might be able to... It like there was a whole lot of room down there. <laughs> you might also be able to say that it's also Tubbs' fault because he just stood there with his mouth agape. He just did. Just staring at the entire thing, watching it happen. He, he didn't, didn't do anything. He didn't do anything to help in that situation. <laughs> like, Crockett's like, I'm going to go around the back. And Tubbs is like, cool, I'm going to sit here and do nothing. <laughs> I'm going to watch. <laughs> I'm going to hang out on the stairs. Yeah, so like when Crockett kicked the gun out of the way, shouldn't have Tubbs like ran up there and got the gun? Or like arrested Angel? <laughs> Not stand there watching. <laughs> Meta helicopter comes in to take Sonny to the hospital. A man's reading off his vitals as they fly. Yeah, I don't think he was that bad off. I watch ER. I know what happens. He's okay. His blood pressure was good. His heart rate was okay. <laughs> and then we're all just thinking like, isn't there something earlier in the show where there was like a bullet with Sonny's name on it? Name on it? Name, name on, on it? Flashback music. And then Evan goes on a long, weird rant. He pulls a gun on Sonny and he goes on to this long, weird rant. And we just basically put together that Evan, yeah, he's he's a cop, but he's in way too deep. Which seems to be pretty thematic for the guys that Sonny knows. Like when those guys resurface, it's all cops that have gone in way too deep. We've had a number of those episodes now. And we know that that's a trigger for Sonny 
mm-hmm. because he's worried about how little of his own identity is left outside of like who he is when he's undercover. It, it, yeah. It's at this point, start getting the feeling that Evan got someone killed or something. This is, this is when I started really getting suspicious that uh, somehow Crockett and Evan were partners and Evan must have gotten another cop killed or something for being, you know, because yeah. like you said, it just seems to always be that theme that there's, that, you know, it's that that reckless cop that that Crockett always gets has this type of attitude towards flashback music. Oh wow! I mean that clip couldn't have got it more on the head, could it? I mean, we just even talked about it back then that there was one for Sonny in an episode called Bullet for Crockett. <laughs> <laughs> it was like almost like yeah. they knew what was going to happen. <laughs> We should always listen to the father from Boy Meets World. <laughs> Every time I think of that episode, I'm like, that's the guy from Boy Meets World. Small side note. He, he, he was also in the movie Deathbed, the bed that eats. <laughs> True. <laughs> Let's not think about that bed, that bed that eats ever again. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. Now, before we continue on with this episode, we do have some guest stars to talk about this week, even in a clip show. There are guest stars. Yeah, so we have, we've already met one of them. Uh, well, actually, we met both of them uh, in Clyde at the beginning of the episode. And we gave, um, dude, the, the full character name is ridiculous considering they just call him Ricky. Uh, <laughs> it's Enrique Morca Mendez and Angela Metapina. We'll call him Ricky and Angel. <laughs> Those people. <laughs> <laughs> So Ricky is played by Jess Borrego, uh, and he's uh, best known for his roles as Cruz Candelara in Blood In, Blood Out. Apparently a, a Oh my god, I love that movie. movie. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> oh, it's a train wreck in the best way, though. <laughs> he also plays Jesse Velasquez in the TV series Fame, which ran from 82 to 87. So Fame, for those of you that weren't around for it, that was the original Glee. That's what they ripped off when it came up with Glee. It was basically a musical TV show about high school Glee club. No, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Glee is a ripoff. So, you know. he, he, he also played Gail Ortega in, tw- in the TV series 24 and George King in season three of Dexter. So he really uh, hit a stride believe, like 30 years after this episode aired, or like 20 years after this episode aired. Pretty much, because uh, here's some of the other stuff that he's been in. So I'll start with some of the movies. On air, Scooby-Doo, The Monster of Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> He was on season three of Fear the Walking Dead. Then here are some of the single episode appearances of TV shows, because he was in a bunch of TV shows as well. He did a single episode of Married with Children, a single episode of Touch and Angel, a single episode of What's New Scooby-Doo 3D. <laughs> in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> That's what led to the monster of Mexico. (laughs) Our next guest star is Lisa Vidal. She's best known for her roles in Third Watch, ER, The Division, and The Event. 2013, she began starring on a BET drama series called Being Mary Jane, which is what she's currently doing. She also played Dr. Sarah Morales from from 99 to 2001 on the TV show Third Watch, and she was firefighter Sandra Lopez from 2001 to 2004 on ER. Mm. Yes, it's a very sad story. Her story's very sad. Is there any happy stories in ER? Yeah, there's people that make it out. Yeah, I don't believe you. (laughs) She died in a fire, (laughs) leaving her her child behind. (laughs) Wait a minute, firefighter (laughs) that died in a fire? That's crazy, right? And the doctor from Third Watch couldn't save her. (laughs) Third Watch didn't make it past season three, so no. (laughs) I know, unfortunately. I know, I love that show. (laughs) A little background. Out of high school, she joined La Familia Theater Company alongside famous actors Raul Julia and Julia Roberts. Wow. Yeah. Had to see she lived up to that billing. (laughs) <laughs> her first film role was the movie delivery boys and she was only about 14 she also did a bunch of appearances on the cosby show from 94 to 95 she had a reoccurring role as as a reporter named carmen on new york undercover and then she also 
in 95 to 96. Regular appearances on the ABC police drama, High Incident. She was also in TV movie series, Naked City, Justice with a Bullet, and Naked City, A Killer Christmas. <laughs> what? Yes. What kind yeah. of crap are that? <laughs> oh, the last thing I'm going to talk about in guest stars is that the doctor who plays Dr. Stillman is an actual doctor. His name is Dr. <laughs> Joseph Arena. <laughs> Dr. Joseph Arena, a dermatologist in either Plantation or Hallandale, Florida. Dermatologist. I'm assuming they're close to each other. He's a dermatologist. A so I am going to be bringing it. <laughs> I'm going to be bringing that up a little bit during the episode because it clearly is a dermatologist uh, <laughs> dermatological emergency. <laughs> There is one other doctor who assists him, and I couldn't squirrel down because there were two doctors in the sa- with the same name from Florida with it. <laughs> is either a plastic surgeon or a CEO president of some big medical fund. So uh, <laughs> the doctor that assists him. But, but still interesting that they got two real doctors to play them. Neither of them surgeons. And neither of them are actors. <laughs> Especially, that obvious. Yes. Especially that guy who's playing the surgeon. <laughs> yes. But if you have a skin condition. <laughs> he was probably one of their dermatologists. Like someone on the show is dermatologist. And like, hey, you want to be in an episode? <laughs> so when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the hospital. The helicopter's landing. Dad and Switek are there on the pad, worried, waiting for Sunny to come off. No, it's actually moving very fast. The hospital staff aren't. They <laughs> no. kind of like saunter out. <laughs> Tubbs hops off. He tells dad that it was Ricky's girlfriend is the one that shot him. Dad says, Switek, go now. Do your Run. job. <laughs> go do something. Get out of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor shows Sonny's badge and it shows that the bullet went through it. So it slowed the bullet down. So it didn't like go out the back or cause more damage and this isn't the first time where maybe something like that has happened 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 flashback music as crockett heads out to this prison to go talk to a man named morata or maroto that's what his name is maroto who is played by the great roberto duran the boxer with 103 wins Roberto Duran. And amazing hair, by the way. <laughs> it was like a helmet, a shellacked helmet or something. <laughs> Crockett comes in. He sees Marado, asks him to come out there. He says that he has something to tell him. There's this pounding music scene where the two come walking into a room. Crockett's very upset. He's like, I drove 70 miles to get here. What? What do you have to tell me? Marado. Andy walked like five miles through the prison. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Marado stands up, grabs Crockett by the face, gives him the kiss to death, and then pulls a handmade gun out of his belt. Like, it's actually, I I want to applaud him for making that. It's pretty ingenious. Yeah, I know. At first, I didn't know it was a gun when I first watched (laughs) that episode. I'm like, okay, so what does he have? It looked like the thing you use to check the pressure on your tire. (laughs) He's got an air gauge. Okay, whatever. (laughs) I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh my god, it's a gun! Yeah, see, I, I'm I'm with you, Melissa. I didn't know what it was first. I'm thinking like, wow, uh, you know, he's got some soft lips. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he just kissed him, and then he pulls that thing out. He kills himself, and the scene ends. And I'm like, did, did he blow himself up? Like, yeah, what exactly <laughs> happened? They don't show it. <laughs> you don't really show that part. <laughs> so that means so we start this episode the same way the last one ended. With Crockett witnessing a suicide. I'm just curious how much Duran got paid for his total of 30 seconds in this episode. <laughs> well, he does say when he grabs Crockett by the face, he, sa- he says, it takes one tough cop to catch me. Now we'll just see how tough you are. Payback. And then he pulls the trigger and he kills himself. Flashback music. Why does his hair look like a helmet? <laughs> I was like, what? You might have to get on a motorcycle later. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, it won't go anywhere. <laughs> he had some, I mean, he's supposed to be in prison. Do they really style their hair like that in prison? Does it matter? He's not going nowhere. <laughs> Who's he supposed to be looking nice for? This is one of Vice's best uses of a guest star. Let's get boxing legend Roberto Duran, and he will do 30 seconds of playing an inmate <laughs> in the very beginning of an episode, and that's it. <laughs> well, I mean, it proves that because they're, they're able to tie Sonny to that money that's just floating out in the ocean. 
I mean, they never got their payback. <laughs> Let's not get into all dun, of the dun, pirate dun. talk. <laughs> yeah, there are still pirates on the who pirates. are supposedly... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he won't be able to sleep tonight thinking about I, that. I, I was... <laughs> <laughs> I just somewhere Frank Zappa is, is looking for Sonny Crockett. He know, uh, and he's gonna kill him. And I don't fear for Sonny. I fear for his poor wife who's touring in Europe right now. <laughs> At the hospital, they're rushing Sonny into surgery. Apparently, they just kind of let anyone into the OR too, because like the whole vice team is just kind of standing around watching it happen. After they brought him into, they're like, "Get out of here!" And they they just kept standing there. <laughs> Tio and Tubby like, "Whatever." <laughs> and this is awfully re- reminiscent of something that Sonny did with his boy Evan. Boy Evan. Boy, boy Evan. Evan. Flashback music. Sonny and Tubbs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what I don't understand mm-hmm. is that. Crockett and Tubbs, they start to walk away, which they have to be good enough cops at this point to understand the position that Evan's been put in. Why they're just trying to walk away and leave the situation as is. I don't understand where they think that that's going to be something feasible. But they have to. They have to because their deal is is that after this is done, after they get the MAC-10s off the street, they make sure that they don't make it to the streets of Miami, they're done. They are not allowed to be to do any more investigation. They have to leave Evan and Guzman alone. They have to keep their undercover, not to let them know that they're cops. Mm. So, so Guzman makes it back to the car and grabs mm-hmm. the gun. And Evan just kind of starts running toward Guzman. Uh, I guess, like Dominic was saying, I guess to protect Sonny and Rico from being shot. But I think we can, what, we all know that I it's, think, it's a little something more at this point, right? That he's been waiting for that bullet for a while. Mm-hmm. It looks more as if he's just trying to get himself shot. It's a suicide mission. He throws himself in front of those bullets to protect Sonny, but also just to end. It was the same thing that Mike did on why Mike died. Crockett quickly shoots Guzman, and it ends with Crockett holding Evan in his arms as Evan dies. And Evan Scene. tells Crockett, and now it's his turn. Turn to take a bullet. Yeah. He says that to him before he dies. He says, it, actually, was Mike's I guess decision, that, it was my decision, th- and now it's your turn. So I guess that comes up later in the series in another episode in which a they bring up the for reference about, a, yeah, a bullet for Crockett, which is brings up the reference him asking Crockett, telling Crockett that there's a bullet out there with his name on it. Flashback music. I mean, the foreshadowing is strong. We should have saw this coming. <laughs> if only in our clip we talked about, like, maybe... This would come up again in an episode in the future. We didn't know, though, because I wasn't there, so I couldn't know. (laughs) Gina and Trudy show up. Gina tries to talk to Sonny as they're moving him, like, into the surgery room. She's, like, got his hand. She's rubbing it and saying, Sonny, I'm here. Acting like she's his wife. Oh, wait. No. (laughs) Don't worry. His wife will never show up and see it. So (laughs) she'll never know what happened. Appropriately enough. Sonny is in surgery. We get our next flashback clip of from Gina as she's remembering all the times she boned Sonny, boned Sonny, boned Sonny. Flashback music. Crockett comes walking up to boat and boom, who's there? Gina! <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so Gina is taking care of her man for a night. She knows he's stressed out and they're going to spend a night together. They're going to that- have the best rosé ever. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that was one of the wettest, wettest kisses I've ever seen, too, man. He was just trying to swallow her face. <laughs> but you know what? Still not as bad as Tubbs, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no one can be that I sweaty don't... during sex, but we'll, we already talked about that. Never I again. just don't think that. I just don't see how this is seen is, is necessary in any way. It was necessary for people who like joy. Well, that. You know, that scene is basically like Gina's taking care of Sonny. She knows he's stressed out and she stays tonight. Flashback music. It's hard to find what specific episode we're watching because they boned on his boat so often. <laughs> So, but uh, we're clearly seeing that Gina, you know, she's reminded now that Sonny's uh, injured. You know, all those times, all those special nights they stayed together. Weird that that, you know, she didn't flashback to like, you know, a week ago when when they kissed. <laughs> Just for the record, they showed Sonny and Gina hooking up for the flashback clip. And they show Sonny telling Caitlin goodbye. 
<laughs> yeah, and there's no hook it up on that <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, uh, they knew what was going to happen. They're the writers. <laughs> <laughs> so now the vice team walks through the press at the hospital. They're trying to find out what's the statuses of the police officer that's been shot. Um, they're all undercover police officers, and they're <laughs> yeah. all walking in front of cameras. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Of course, of course, the press shows up. You know, whenever an undercover cop gets shot, you know, it's always big headlines. <laughs> <laughs> they release it out. Yeah. And then we go to the greatest stock footage clips ever of someone doing surgery and it's not even like regular camera work it's like someone was filming the ter- their tv screen of a it surgery the they saw on the tlc thing. network <laughs> that was the weirdest it was like like they took it off the tv when they watched a documentary about surgery <laughs> clearly my I, wife I was like was... listen we don't want to pay for the surgery scene okay we don't want to have a realistic one go get one you put your camera in front of a tv <laughs> where they're playing some medical videos and get it that way i was watching it and i was thinking in my head we can rebuild him we have the technology. <laughs> exactly. But we don't want to spend a lot of money. <laughs> we can we get the budget version. <laughs> so now the whole. I, I, I'm curious what der, what dermatological procedure we're watching here. <laughs> Are they removing a wart? <laughs> mole checking. He was checking on moles right around his wound. <laughs> Is this now when the- they do them skin grafts? You know, where they like, take your butt and put it on your face. <laughs> Now the whole vice team is there. Tubbs is sad. He's second guessing himself for obvious reasons. Because he didn't do his job. <laughs> Dad says you never second guess yourself. And Tubbs now has a flashback. I'm of... second guessing himself. <laughs> now this flashback is great. We're not actually going to do a clip of the flashback here because it's Tubbs having a flashback, flashback of, of when flash- he had a flashback <laughs> of seeing when his brother got killed by Calderon. So it was a flashback of a flashback. Yeah. When he made a mistake, and what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> he was seeing maybe he thinks of Crockett as his brother, you know, his brother from another mother, and he got shot, and he thinks it brings him back to when his own brother died, oh, okay. and he didn't do anything about it. <laughs> yeah, and he didn't do his job. Okay, I yeah. Once again, he wasn't doing his job. <laughs> he was very young though in that clip. <laughs> The doctor comes in. The first surgery is done. He's holding steady. Crockett's doing okay. He's still alive, but they couldn't get the bullet. The bullet is lodged in his spine. So apparently that, maybe if that badge wouldn't have slowed down the bullet, it just would have went out the back and like everything would be okay. (laughs) (laughs) That slippery bullet. (laughs) Was greased up or something. (laughs) Yeah, just kept moving. We'll try again in a few hours. Have you heard from his wife? (laughs) <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I, let me say this a different way. Because the doctor comes in, he, he goes, had trouble contacting his wife, locating his wife. The vice squad basically says, we've had trouble contacting her too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only if someone would contact Caitlin, Caitlin, Caitlin. Flashback music. The couple's talking at the Crockett Mansion. She's saying, I'm going to miss you. I'm going on my tour. I have all these stops. I'm going to be gone for a long time. Three and- weeks. <laughs> hey now. Hey now. <laughs> yeah, that song in the background. Don't dream it's over. <laughs> and you know what? Thank God she's leaving. Because if she couldn't handle this case with her record label executive being a murderer, she's not going to be able to handle the bull scheme and smuggling ring <laughs> next week. So it's probably for the best that she's leaving. Oh, can't handle Crockett be- pretending to be a cowboy. <laughs> and then not much longer after that, there's the baseballs of death. So I don't know how she's going to handle any of those. <laughs> and the episode ends with the freeze frame of Sad Crockett. Sad Crockett has returned, people. <laughs> well, that's better than Happy Crockett. It's so creepy. Yeah, I bet Bone Sir. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> the only thing is worse is Tubbs' feet sex. <laughs> Flashback music. And it's him telling her goodbye. Get out of here. See you later. <laughs> We're going to have the longest three week gap we've ever had in our lives. Yeah, so. so. <laughs> <laughs> She's only supposed to be gone for three weeks. What kind of three weeks is this? <laughs> it's been like six months since he's seen her. It's been like, you know, how many I episodes think... since he talked to her? Yeah, exactly. Like, we even had her on the phone. <laughs> I, I, I do think it's kind of endearing. At, you know, the only flashback he has of his wife while he's in the, you know, coma is the last time he lied to her. <laughs> I don't know that he's supposed to be having these flashbacks. I think it's supposed to be like the people 
I can't figure that out. And each person is having their own so individual. Who in that ones. room has that flashback of him telling Caitlin goodbye? <laughs> Tubbs, because he was like watching from a balcony. He's like, "Bye, later. Get, See you get, later, girl. Get the hell out of here." <laughs> Caitlin's having Caitlin's having that flashback somewhere in Europe right now. <laughs> and on the airplane that he can't get a hold of her on. <laughs> All right, so now it's getting late. Tubbs is pacing around. He gets the hospital cold coffee. Goes over to the stair-in window. And he's drinking some coffee and watching the rain come down. The rain in window. <laughs> and he's just thinking about my buddy. My buddy. My buddy. Flashback music. Tubbs runs and he jumps in the boat and he starts driving away. And Crockett, he's going to chase him in his car. And it made me think of the episode of The Simpsons with Night Boat. <laughs> the crime <laughs> song. <laughs> 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 and of course he's like chasing him in his car and he's able to and then like Tubbs looks like he's getting away and then magically because Don Johnson some sort of superhuman he's on the bridge that Tubbs is going to go underneath I mean I just assume that again- he could be in multiple places at once that that's just something they haven't introduced yet but he is also a magician and once again <laughs> obviously Tubbs not very familiar with boats um, why is he getting away by driving along the road? <laughs> <laughs> it seems very easily. You could easily get away, make a right turn, and then there's nothing. Cro- You've stymied him. Crockett cannot recover. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, but Crockett jumps into the boat. They have a fight. They realize they're both police officers, and then it sets up, you know, the talk back and forth where they're on the bridge, and and Crockett's very upset that that he didn't know that Tubbs was a police officer. And flashback music, my buddy and me. All I could think of was that commercial, kid sister, kid, and that was the last time you see Tubbs driving a boat. (laughs) They never let him do it again. It turns out he does not know what the hell he's doing with a boat. <laughs> this reminds us how dumb they were back then. You know, Tubbs is trying to get up, get away on a boat following the land. Um, <laughs> Crockett's desperately trying to pull the boat over in a car. <laughs> like, none of this is going to work. <laughs> Ultimately, it leads with Crockett jumping off a bridge and beating up a black guy. I have a serious question. What happened to Tubbs' New York accent? <laughs> Because it was in that clip. This, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was really, he had a really big New York accent, too. <laughs> Tubbs is now looking at his badge. And Dr. Stillman. <laughs> <laughs> they hear over the intercom and they come rushing back to see Sonny being rushed back to the OR again. <laughs> I can't. I'm already thinking about it. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with that doctor? Why did he walk that way? <laughs> he looked like he pooped his pants and he was walking with it. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> It was like he was trying to hold something between his legs while he walked. <laughs> the rash is spreading. This is, this is a huge emergency. The rash is spreading everywhere. Well, so if you're a dermatologist doing surgery, you try to sneak around a medical dictionary with you. That's just in case. Something. I'm telling you, there was something wrong with that lower half. You could not run right. <laughs> in the OR, they're removing the bullet, but they can't wait for the real doctor to come who's on his <laughs> way back from Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. The assistant doctor is a, a plastic surgeon, so he can start the nose job right now. <laughs> hey, Sonny might get some huge breasts out of this, okay? <laughs> Outside the OR, Castillo and Tubbs are watching. Which I don't think is allowed. <laughs> I've never seen that in any other hospital. <laughs> And is this really the best clip that they could find of Sonny and Castillo <laughs> working together? Of Castillo telling Sonny, like, I know you shot a kid. You need to take responsibility for that. Yeah, but you know what, though? I I did think that in the beginning. But in that clip, I did realize something. He tells him, like, he cares about him. He's like, we all care about you. I care about you. We we all are, have your back and everything. That's like the first time I ever remember, like, Castillo ever being like, that's a tender moment for him. That saying, like, hey, I really like you, and I want you to stick around. Like, <laughs> I'm willing to forget you shot a kid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't give a crap about that kid you shot. <laughs> Once again, this is another flashback where it's like, I can't narrow down what episode exactly it is because Castillo has said you're off the case so often. <laughs> you got broken record. I, I, I feel like... 
I feel like personally I would have gone with the meat fondler episode for this flashback, but I mean, what do I know? <laughs> Dan and Tubbs are still watching. Gina comes over and says they can't get a hold of Caitlin because she's in Europe touring and she's somewhere on an airplane. Tubbs leaves. Gina turns to Dad and says that she had an argument with Sonny that morning and doesn't want it to be the last conversation that she had at with her him. house naked. No, I'm <laughs> Not at her house. It was after boat sex. I think she <laughs> yeah. was thinking about boat sex earlier. And Melissa, Dad's got this look on his face like. Uh, this is then I have to give. I'm gonna have to give you a hug. He turns and he like swallows really hard, like ah oh, crap, and he goes in for the hug. Like all right, come on, let's do this. <laughs> and I know because that's the way my grandpa would hug you. He like the arms out, kind of. It's a Mexican old man hug. <laughs> in the waiting room, Switech comes in. He found Ricky's girlfriend, like a picture of her, and he shows her the tub. Tub's like, yep, yeah, that's the girl. Because Switech is the only one doing any work during this whole thing. He's not. He hasn't been at the yeah. hospital. He's been actually guys, doing his job. <laughs> yeah, everyone else is just sitting at the hospital. So I think is actually doing police work. Like he's the only one doing police work this whole episode. Well, besides Izzy, <laughs> and he's not. Well, that's what I was gonna say. And he was the one that solves the case. <laughs> Later, Tubbs is asleep in the waiting room. He wakes up and goes back to a staring window. <laughs> and Tubbs is just thinking about all the times that him and his buddy have done boat chases. Boat chases. Boat, boat chases. chases. Boat. Flashback music. In comes this big plane. It lands. A boat comes pulling up to it. The duo are watching from a distance. And this plane is making me very uncomfortable because not only does it have no flight plan sent to the local airport, and it can land literally anywhere and then just take off again without having to report to anyone. But when they land and they show the pilot, he is his window is extremely close to the surface of the water. <laughs> Something tells me a really light airplane won't do so well with a little bit of water inside of it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just love Tubbs and Crockett in this opening because they're sitting in the boat, you know, just two friends boating in suits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how everyone boats in their three-piece suit. <laughs> can't be too formal on a boat um, <laughs> they're watching it, it almost seems like crockett's perturbed a little bit that the drug deal is taking this long yeah like, let's speed <laughs> this thing up come on and they see an exchange of briefcases and then the plane just takes off and the boat that pulled up takes off too and crockett just says okay here we go and it turns into a chase like so the people there knew the entire time that they were police and still did their deal or something like no they didn't know they were there that's just they just started following them breakneck speeds oh my favorite part of miami vice is when Tubbs has to ride in a boat because he <laughs> is clearly terrified <laughs> he's like gritting his teeth he the whole time he's he, like sweating bullets like he really is terrified <laughs> i mean i know he Crockett clearly is a crazy hates driver. this part <laughs> yeah he does like they didn't pay yeah. him enough to be in this role clearly in that boat <laughs> and Dominic right crockett just takes off into a boat chase you know like, like it was planned planes are greater than boats in chases so <laughs> <laughs> hey you know what don johnson cannot help it he is a boat champion and he has to show his driving skills his I'm sorry his boating skills it might, so might the plane gets away <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> let's just make that clear right now the plane gets away but yeah. the other boat almost gets away but then hits a road <laughs> you know those pesky roads that get in your way when you try and jump them <laughs> my two favorite parts of this chase is one tubs is not trying really hard to throw up during the entire chase <laughs> don't throw up don't throw up don't throw up <laughs> and two that takes place through a neighborhood and <laughs> just imagine the sunny does this for fun on yeah. the weekends, he hauls ass through people's <laughs> neighborhoods, blowing by <laughs> Castillo's house on the weekend. <laughs> Castillo just comes running out. Maverick! Yeah. <laughs> he goes, I said no flybys. <laughs> It's like those weird neighborhoods where they have their own dock and stuff. It's like we're supposed to be really peaceful. You're not supposed to speed through there in your speedboat. Mm -hmm. Get out there on your pontoon. Some speedboat just comes over and knocks you over. Flashback music. Turns out planes are faster than boats, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially faster. when boats so. stay in the water, maybe that would be better. <laughs> Try and jump on the road. I don't know if you know this, but you yeah, can't but go this is the road. Pretty good, but this is a pretty good breakdown of Tubbs and Crockett's time hanging out on boat. It usually <laughs> ends in some kind of chase, uh, crashing into or onto 
roads and into buildings. <laughs> Trudy pulls Tubbs out of his flashback and says that they can go visit. They can go visit Sonny in the in the ICU now. They both go back and go talk to him. This is like the type of acting that DJ prefers. Because he just has to lay there and do nothing. So he just kind of lays there while everyone else is doing stuff. <laughs> he was acting like he was in a coma. That was hard. Trudy talks to Sonny and remembers a one time that they worked together. <laughs> More than one time. Hey, you remember that one time we did some stuff? Remember I was a hooker. <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably the only time he ever said anything positive to her. True. <laughs> True. Can't argue that. <laughs> yeah, because he's never slept with Trudy, so we know he says positive stuff to Gina. <laughs> never slept with her, but funny enough, it's the episode's called The Dutch Oven. <laughs> <laughs> and Trudy just thinks, remember, Sonny, when I killed that guy? That guy? That guy? Flashback music. <laughs> Trudy hops in the Ferrari with Crockett. Crockett takes off after, we'll call him Bill, takes off after Bill as they go f- driving around Miami and you see, you get a lot of slow-mo shots of Trudy who looks like she's totally out of her element. This she's is- terrified. She's like, she can't move. She's I frozen. Think she's just terrified of, I think she's just terrified of driving with Crockett. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't look like he can control the car either. Like the way he's driving is really funny. Like holding the steering wheel like he can barely control it. So no wonder she's terrified. <laughs> Every time they come back to her, it's it looks a lot like if the car was to stop, she would just jump out. This is not the ride I want to be on. So they chase yeah. Bill all the way down. They get him cornered, and he pops out of the car. And so Gina and Trudy also – sorry, Gina and Trudy. I mean, I'm going to say that a lot in this. <laughs> Crockett and Trudy hop out of the Ferrari, but uh, Bill – call him bad guy Bill. He just shoots at Crockett. Misses Crockett takes cover and they do yell out Miami Vice freeze and he fires a couple shots misses Crockett and Trudy takes aim fires off four perfectly aimed shots drops the bad guy right there in the street saving Crockett too by the way because it turns out she knows how to be a policewoman after all. <laughs> Even after in the prodigal son where they run in and there's shootings and they just turn to Trudy and go get help. <laughs> it turns out get it would be better if she yes. was there. <laughs> that would have been hilarious that Crockett stops the car and yells at Trudy, go get help, girl. <laughs> <laughs> no, instead she goes all uh, uh she goes all secret agent, like superhero, and, and lit takes out the bad guy. You can, yeah, at the end of this scene though, you see Crockett. He like slowly looks at her, then he walks over to the bad guy laying in the street. She asks if he's dead, and Crockett confirms that and you can see on both sides both of them are like i can't believe that just happened and not that a, that, that they had to shoot a bad guy because crockett does that every day that's just part of his mo that's how do you think he gets ferrari yeah, so he's his white suits three and... people but yeah he's probably already killed three people today <laughs> yeah. but all the shock is on trudy shooting someone and she's even surprised too it's something that lo- it looks like she takes personally unlike the rest of the vice team hey they've killed so many people yeah, right actually... now they can't take them all personally <laughs> Flashback music. I really, really hoped that Trudy would have more face makeup like that in the rest <laughs> of the show. They ran out. Yeah. They used it all that one episode. <laughs> but damn, man, like she gangster on him. Like as soon as they stop, like she unloads like half a clip. Anyone else fires, you know? <laughs> and so he just kind of looks over at her like, holy crap. <laughs> Trudy leaves and we go to commercial. When we come back from commercial, Switek is talking to the dad. They can't find the girlfriend. He thinks that she might skip town because her dad has an airplane. So they're monitoring for airplanes. There's no flight log showing that it's taken off recently. In the ICU, Izzy walks in and is surprised to see Sonny. He's got flowers for him. He's actually really endearing to Sonny, yeah. too. He's like really sad for him. Mm-hmm. Even all the times that Sonny has taken advantage of him. But he thinks of, they, they think of him as friends, like they're friends. And he's just thinking about, remember that one time? That we did, we actually did something fun together. Fun together. Fun, fun together. together. Flashback music. Up from behind, Max Maxwell comes Izzy Moreno, and Izzy is surprisingly pro Sunny and wearing the most amazing outfit. Can we get that <laughs> out there? The like bright teal pants and that like triangle shirt he was wearing. <laughs> I don't know what I like better: the speech he gives uh, while he's pointing the fish at the guy, or the fact that the whole time he's trying to sell Crockett his rusty Maverick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's trying to give him his rusty car, but it's got it's got AM/FM radio in it, though. I mean, come on. <laughs> uh-huh. 
eventually, Maxwell packs up his stuff and he leaves when he tries to go down to get the keys and then Elvis chases him out of the boat. He just takes off. Flashback music. I can't believe this is the only clip they ha- that they could use for Izzy. There's so many better clips of Izzy. I was so relieved they didn't use one with him and the Nook Man together. <laughs> Blasphemy. I'm like, don't you dare. Don't you do it. I can't remember. Was he trying to sell those fish uh, in that episode? <laughs> Oh, no, I don't wait. remember. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the fish were for Elvis. <laughs> yeah, they could be because that then the guy goes down there and meets Maybe. Elvis. Yeah. We haven't seen in quite a while. Oh, he's Elvis! Dead. How come we didn't get an Elvis flashback? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Elvis. Like I know <laughs> his mouth open, just looking off into minute, the water. Wait a minute. <laughs> All the time, crocking through dog food at him. <laughs> go. Get your bag of dog food. That one time he ate it. <laughs> yeah, he kept eating stuff. He's like, what kind of house is this? <laughs> no, nothing. Uh, okay. Izzy runs hey, off. When by he's- the way, I, I, didn't even, I didn't even think about that. He's in the hospital after getting shot. Zytek's working. Everybody else is at the hospital. Who's watching? Who's feeding Elvis? <laughs> I think Elvis is gone at this point because... They haven't said anything about him in a long time. Even with, like, where is he living when he married Caitlin? <laughs> he's just staying on the boat by himself? That's lonely. <laughs> did, did he did he tame to a farm? <laughs> yeah, I think he's at a farm, John. He's running wild. Don't worry. He's okay. He's running free on a farm. <laughs> I don't know. This okay. one Native American reservation. <laughs> they make it, they're putting him to sleep right now. Every night, a Native American rubs his belly and puts him to sleep. He's good. <laughs> Izzy runs off when he hears someone coming and Stan. Stan walks in and sees the IV in Sonny's arm and immediately has memories of Zito. Oh, Zito. Zito. And we see in Switek's eye what happened, what happened, what what happened. Flashback music. All right, Miami Vice, this was evil. Why did you put this clip in here? This was not fair. No. This was not fair. None of us are ready to handle this. And also, this is the only way you put Zito in here. There's only one other mention of Zito in this, and it's in the bulk, like, montage yeah, flashback. it's when they're being, like, bums or something. Mm-hmm. He's just in there, yeah, too. Yeah. How yeah. dare you only bring Zito back in this light? Show him as when Stan thinks he's a junkie and he's died. But also, why do we not ever... There should have been a, a, should have been a Stan thing, right? Stan has worked with Crockett a bunch in a bunch of different aspects, and he's done a lot of stuff for Crockett, and he does all, like, the surveillance. Isn't there a clip of them working together? Can't he yell at him for eating too many hot dogs? <laughs> what about the time Stan screwed uh, something up and then Crockett's like, look what you did, stupid. <laughs> Could they have used that? Wrong in thinking that Zito and Crockett were friends. Maybe he didn't like Zito. Maybe they weren't friends. Maybe we maybe we misread that. Weird that we only see Zito's dead body in Stan's flashback, <laughs> but not in any of Crockett's. Izzy comes out from hiding and goes to Stan. He shows Stan that he's got this good luck rock from Cuba, too. As soon as he shows it to him, Sunny flatlines. (laughs) And all the nurses come right in and use the defibrillator on him. He literally says, uh, he's going to be okay. And then... (laughs) (laughs) So Itek and Izzy go walking out, and they're off the... Like, okay. Like, they're kind of chatting as they leave, and he Stan shows Izzy a picture of the woman, and he's like, yeah, I know who that is, or I, I know of her. Let me make a phone call. Yeah, I know. He gets the address. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, Izzy knows her. Why weren't they trying to show him the picture earlier? He probably took um, naked pictures of her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's got this naked picture taken thing. <laughs> it cuts to Chubbs at an airport on the car phone saying he's checking on it. To see if the dad's plane is there. And he sees like a plane landing right then. So he's just hoping that this is the one. And he starts to remember. And I don't know if this is him remembering. Or if or we're like collectively remembering everyone's memories. Because now we're going to go into super flashback montage mode. <laughs> and we get Of lots- course, it would involve Jimbo and Jimbo Airlines and Armed Services. <laughs> and the hundreds of times they've tested cocaine. You have to know that Sonny and Rico have done a lot of cocaine. Right? Yeah, I think we should address that. <laughs> Some of us ended up in their nose somehow yes. along the line. In their system somehow, they've done it. All those times they've tested yes. it, you can't tell me they haven't done it. Of course. So. Lots of and jumping out windows, stuff blowing up. It's every and, action scene in every episode. And I wouldn't be surprised if they did some of that coke with good old Jimbo or Glenn <laughs> Fry. <laughs> One of the two. One of them parties. Law country. <laughs> yeah, so we go in rapid succession. 
And it's actually cool and also kind of sad as you see everyone age. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see Sonny's hair warp when you're like... It's basically clips of the entire series drastically ch- taking out of o- order. Glenn Fry basically plays this out. <laughs> yeah, and I don't understand what the... Um... Like what the theme was? It was what was it just to show everyone like in the like a whole bunch of different stuff? I don't know because I thought it was just the drug stuff, and then it started going off like on when they were doing bus and like them hiding and <laughs> vice things. <laughs> Keep singing, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> the plane is getting ready to take off, but the police are able to block it. Tubbs goes over to the limo, rips the door open. Angel's inside and gets her arrested. They're able to get her right before she's able to escape. Back at the hospital, the vice team plus Izzy are getting antsy. They're pacing around in the waiting room. Eventually, the doctor comes out and says they got the bullet. He's going to be okay. So now we get more clips yeah. of the montage of everyone being happy now. <laughs> In case and in case you were wondering, more Glenn Fry. So just, <laughs> in case you didn't get enough Smuggler Blues in the first montage, we're we're gonna continue <laughs> to play it for you in the second montage. Um, but also, I want to congratulate the dermatologist, Doctor Arena. <laughs> um, it, it it only took him slightly over a day to narrow. <laughs> <laughs> to capture that wily bullet. <laughs> Tubbs comes in and says that they got Angel. Gina puts the bullet inside of Sonny's hand, who's now awake, and he smiles and sees that the whole vice team is there, happy that he's still alive. The end. He's going to make it, guys. Uh, this episode has nothing to do with anything else. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be okay from here on out, and- right? Nothing bad happens to him. Oh, so I was fully expect this to be like the beginning of his coma, but I, I, I guess that's still to come. I guarantee you next week we're going to see him. He's going to be walking around like nothing happened, you know, <laughs> jogging and stuff. Even though he just got <laughs> shot in the chest and almost died. <laughs> Didn't have a collapse long or anything. Like he'd be totally fine. But let's blow him up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, my friends... It's the clip show of a clip show. We did it. Clip within a clip. <laughs> and you know what's going to happen? We've got to talk about this week's music. And this week's music is going to be very, very unique because it's more clips of clips. <laughs> more clips of clips of clips. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John, we got music from the best of the best, right? I mean, this is like the cream of the crop when it comes to music for Vice. Uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> a very unenthusiastic. Eh. Uh, no, you know, I will say they took a good crop of songs, but they were definitely picked specific songs, or I should say they picked specific scenes to flashback that happened to have the song from that episode in it. I wasn't sure so, if that was a coincidence or if it was like planned that way or if they were like, yeah. oh, shit, like, we got to put this music in. I think it was them just being lazy. Honestly, um, <laughs> because I, they could have got other music and put it toward clips of, you know, stuff going on. But instead, they were just like, we already put a song to a scene in this episode. Let's just cut out that scene. <laughs> Let's get into it. Even though we've already talked about all of this music in the, their respective episodes. Let's go through it again, starting with the very first song of the series. The most iconic song of the series, In the Air Tonight, by Phil Collins, who finds his way, who found his way into, as the show as a guest star, into like six different episodes music, into like another dozen episodes, other people's music bios, somehow he slipped in there. (laughs) The many, many, many times we've talked about Phil Collins, I'm sure this will be some random clip of me. (laughs) <laughs> Telling you how great his collection of <laughs> of Alamo stuff is, or how he's down to just three hairs, three hairs, three hairs. Flashback music. <laughs> Fix this in the record to make up for this was to have the drummer play like a marching band style. <laughs> okay, Bill Collins has said that this marching band style is something influenced the way he played drums in several tracks in the mid '80s. I don't know if I believe it, but damn it, Phil, get out of my music! <laughs> Come on, man, give me a music segment where you're not involved. Flashback music. <laughs> damn it, Phil Collins, when you get out of my music? Like, we are almost done it with the show, and you're still popping up, and I'm probably gonna have to talk about you again at the end of season four. So, 
I'm sure whatever you heard was fantastic and uh, <laughs> like fantastic job. I'm positive. <laughs> I'm sure it was hilarious. Can't you hear me laughing in the background? All right. So our next song is Don't Dream It's Over by Crowded House, which shows up in Rock in a Hard Place. Uh, it's from the end of the episode is where the flashback comes from. If you remember, they were an alien-based New Zealand rock band. So, and if you don't remember, here's a little clip for you. Clip for you. Clip for you. Flashback music. Well, I want to start out with the song I was seeing moment moment ago. Don't dream, <laughs> it's over. By Crowded House. Crowded House is an Aussie New Zealand band. Neil Finn, vocalist and guitarist, is a New Ze- New Zealander. Whereas Nick Seymour and Paul Hester on bass and drums were Aussies. They were formed in Melbourne, Australia in 1985. And actually saw quite a bit of international success off of their first few albums. And then things kind of trail off from there. The band saw most of their success, their first self-titled debut album, uh, which actually reached number 12 on U.S. album charts in 1987 and provided top 10 hits, uh, Something So Strong, and this song. Most of their success later in their career, though, was in Australia and New Zealand. Their fourth albums actually saw success in UK, Europe, and even South Africa. Finn and Hester were former members of a New Zealand band called Split Ends that was actually founded by... Finn's older brother, Tim Finn, they would form Crowded House. The funny thing about them being in Tim Finn's previous band was at somewhere around their third album, the band had taken a break after a Canadian leg of their Temple of the Low Men tour. Finn and his brother Tim actually co-wrote an album called Finn. And then Neil would start working the follow-up third album with Hester and Seymour, but what they would give to the record company be rejected so mm. neil asked tim hey man can i use some of the songs that we recorded on for finn his brother tim was like oh you know jokingly said yes only if he becomes a, a member of the band <laughs> so in 1990 he officially joined the band as they used multiple songs off of their record <laughs> finn for their third album <laughs> it actually leave uh, about a year or two later they would break up in 96 tim and neil finn would go on to do solo work whereas the drummer paul hester would actually work with children's entertainers the wiggles he would play <laughs> paul the cook Oh, I know who Paul the Cook is. <laughs> In my that, years that's of watching the, drummer, the Wiggles, Crowded House. <laughs> <laughs> they also have his own ABC uh, show in Australia called Hesse's Shed. Uh, I don't want to uncomfortable at all. <laughs> that I have not seen. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> so, it. On Hesse's Shed in 1997, it would be the last actual time that Finn, Seymour, and Hester performed together on a stage. They would perform together to promote Neil Finn's solo record that was releasing the following year. Unfortunately, in 2005, Hester died by suicide. Oh, wow. After he died, in 2006, the band would reform with Matt Sherrod taking over drumming and they would actually release two uh two more albums and both would reach number one on aussie charts in 2010 the band would will have uh, had officially sold over 10 million records flashback music <laughs> john oh man as you see though i learned so much from your music segments about australian music that ranks up there with my love of jazz. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our next song in the episode is Be My Enemy by the Water Boys, who are a Scottish folk rock band. We've actually seen a number of these Scottish folk bands before, but they were featured in the episode Lend Me an Ear. And it was for the flashback of Crockett and Tubbs chasing Dykstra on the boat. Chasing Dykstra on the boat. So here is me talking about Scottish folk band. Scottish folk band. Scottish, Scottish folk, folk band. band. Flashback music. We get to our third song called Be My Enemy by the Waterboy. The Waterboys are an Irish Scottish 
folk rock band formed in Edinburgh in 1983 by Scottish musician Mike Scott. Scott released a number of uh, solo recordings in late 81 to early 82. Those solo recordings would actually lead to him forming the short-lived band the Red and the Black, with future members of the Waterboys. So in 83, the label, who at the time was thinking they were getting a solo record, would actually get the first debut album of the Waterboys, formerly the Red and the Black. They would take the name of the band from a Lou Reed song called The Kids off the album Berlin. They would add keyboardist Carl Wallinger. Their early music, their first three albums, would be known as their big music, stage. They would tour supporting bands like The Pretenders and U2. So in 85, Winston would leave to join the band China Crisis. The trio would add Wickham's on violin after hearing a demo he did with Sinead O'Connor. Kind of important because that would be as they released their third album, which sold better than the earlier two, but promotion efforts would be stalled when they would refuse to appear on the show Top of Pops because they didn't want to have to lip sync their song. So toward the end of this tour for that third album, Carl Wallinger would leave to start his own band called World Party. That would lead to the more reggae phase, uh, or what they call the Graggle Taggle Band era. <laughs> of the Water Boys would begin with Wickham moving to Dublin and he would get super into traditional folk music and so their next few albums would be mixed among critics and it would eventually start the disillusion of the band. So going into the early 90s they would break up with Scott trying to go solo until the Scott would resurrect the band, but name only, because it would be him with a bunch of new members, occasionally releasing and touring all the way up until, two, I mean, even in 2015, he released a new album called Mo Modern Blues. Waterboys, still out there, still floating around, but just not the original members. Flashback music! Ah, that was fantastic. <laughs> I love those Scottish... <laughs> Amazing. I made a good point in that. Did you hear what I said at the beginning? <laughs> All good points, John. All good points. All right. So moving on, we have Di <laughs> <laughs> We have Diamond Field. <laughs> we have Diamond Field by Pat Benatar. This is from the episode Dutch Oven from the flashback where Trudy kills the dealer. My but favorite Benatar episode name. My favorite episode. Yes, yes, I love, I love the Dutch oven. So, <laughs> uh, and... <laughs> probably should have said that. <laughs> I might regret that. <laughs> this episode's going horribly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Pat Benatar, and we didn't just see her in the episode Dutch Oven. We also saw her in the episode Milk Run with Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Personally, I think it's a better song. But here's me talking about Diamond Field. Diamond Field. Diamond Field. Flashback music. So, moving on, the next song we have is Diamond Field by Pat Benatar. This is during the opening car chase scene. Pat Benatar, man, she is really just the pinnacle of an American success story. I, I will just be first to say that. Her her actual Christian name, I, I'm not even going to try and pronounce um, <laughs> that. Her last name is some crazy Polish last name. Her hits include Hit Me With Your Best Shot, Love Is A Battlefield. She's a four-time Grammy winner. But what I mean by she's an American success story is, uh, so she dropped out of Stony Brook College after her first year at, at the age of 19 to marry her husband, Dennis Benatar. Thankfully, she took his last name. Yeah. I didn't realize that was a married name. I figured that was a stage name. Yeah. Like, her actual last name has like 32 vowels in it. <laughs> <laughs> her husband, Dennis, was actually an Army draftee and Specialist E4 stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia for three years. And while he was stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia, Pat worked as a bank teller. So, so she would work as a bank teller and eventually she would quit because she would she wanted to take her singing and make it a full-time job. So she got a job as a singing waitress at a restaurant called the Roaring Twenties. She worked there and worked her way onto a never-aired PBS special before getting in to start playing several clubs and eventually got her big 
Drake as a rock star. So it really worked mm. her way all the way up. You know, from singing waitress to failed PBA, PBS specials, all the way to four-time Grammy Award winner. Flashback music. I still prefer Hit You With Your Best Shot. I prefer Dutch Oven over Milk Run, so... Um... <laughs> Fire away, John. <laughs> <laughs> So, got got to show support for my girl, Trudy. <laughs> Our fifth song in the episode is There's a River by Steve Winwood. If you might remember him, he was in the Spencer Davis group. He was in Blind Faith with Eric Clapton and in the band Traffic. He, this up pops up in the episode Down for the Count Part 1. You know, where we find Dito dead with the needle in his arm. <laughs> Uh, harsh, harsh. But, <laughs> well, he was a junkie. We, we, we have to recognize he was a junkie. They, they never proved otherwise. <laughs> uh, Steve Winwood also popped up in other episodes, Trust Fund Pirates and by Hooker by Crook. So here's me giving you the lowdown on Steve Winwood. Steve Winwood. Steve Winwood. Flashback music. Steve Winwood, man. I mean, that guy, he's... He's a real he, man. He's, he's a musician. <laughs> he, he makes things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he makes music. And he reminds me of that guy, you know. <laughs> Our last song of the episode is, of course, Smuggler's Blues from the episode of the same name in which Glenn Fry basically had a crazy dream that he wrote a song for that became an episode of Vice. <laughs> no other reason. than Glenn Fry was in the Eagles and he was partying with Don Johnson. And somehow Phil Collins was involved, I'm sure. <laughs> um, you know, they, may, maybe they all went to a David Bowie concert together. <laughs> then we've got Smuggler's Blues. So in the flashback, Jimmy, Tubbs, and Crockett leave Columbia, uh, leave the Columbian airport. Leave the Columbian airport because, you know, once again, airplanes greater than boats. Greater than boats. Greater, greater than, than boats. boats. Greater Flashback music. There are two songs in this episode. One being, you guessed it, Smuggler's Blues by Glenn Fry. What? And so Smuggler's Blues was on uh is on the album The Alt Nighter, which was released in 1984 by Glenn Fry. And this is a few years after the Eagles officially broke up and disbanded, and everyone kind of started their own solo careers. So this song or and this album is basically the second solo album from glenn fry and this is his him trying to be pick up popularity as a solo artist and the song was so awesome that it inspired miami vice to make an episode that's what's crazy here is that it wasn't that they had heard the song and they were forced into a a contract of like glenn fry's doing a solo career we got to do an episode where where we work in glenn fry and it wasn't just a regular episode that they actually and then just put Glenn Fry as a character and actually took the song and then turned the song into an episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing is they liked the writers liked the song so much it inspired them to write the episode and then they thought it would be fun to have him as a guest star too in the episode. So basically, uh, the song Smuggler's Blues inspired this all of this bad, bad TV, but it did lead to a semi successful career for Glenn Fry, a solo career for Glenn Fry. And then eventually he would tour later in life with, with the Eagles. I just assumed that this was like true eighties fashion where like in movies where you'd see the recap at the end, they would have hired someone to do a song about what happened. I assumed that they had this episode and then they decided to have Glenn Fry. like he was now like doing solo projects, trying some new stuff. Maybe he wanted to try acting. And so they thought, oh, bonus, we have a like a guest star who's a musician. And then he wrote the song like for for the episode. And that would make more sense. Like right. he watched the episode like... Right. Uh, Mad Max Thunderdome. Oh, like, and Tina Turner sing, made that song for the movie after watching the movie. Basically, so it, 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 it's even deeper than that. So it wasn't just hearing the song. What really inspired them is the music video for the song. If you watch the music video for the song, it is basically what they were trying to go for in this episode in the music video. The music video being made for they made this episode. So they're basically taking hit Glenn Fry's music video and going, we could turn that into a Miami <laughs> Vice episode fairly easily. Flashback music. Good old outlaw country. I'll never get tired of Smuggler's <laughs> Blues. 
Jimbo. You know, the best people are named Jimbo. Just saying. <laughs> oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're the best. Jimbo's a guy who come help you start your car and have a marble red for you. <laughs> so I also, before we end our music, I do want to point out, playing along at home or counting along at home, you'll notice that not every flashback had its own music. But don't worry, Vice thought of this because Jan Hammer, his music were played with five of the other flashbacks. So almost every flashback had music accompanying with it. <laughs> and Hammer music that he chose, Miami Vice theme, Feedback, Heaven, Cool Running, and Shadow in the Dark. So you might also be n- noticing Jan Hammer often names his music, same as the episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Jan Hammer songs have titles? That's just called like scene 24-7-B? <laughs> No, we are real. He's a real musician. What are you saying about Jan Hammer? He can name things too. So there you have it, our music. So and again, full of fantastic jokes from yours truly. <laughs> All right, let's finish off this clip section of clips and end this thing with less clips. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. Clips of our final thoughts. <laughs> All right, guys, I know the final thoughts are going to be really thin on this episode because it was a <laughs> clip show. <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? It was a very nice clip show. The story was a little flimsy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get past, the fact that, get past the fact that his wife didn't even show up or call. I mean, can't she call from her plane? <laughs> and be like, I was like, what? <laughs> also, they didn't include his uh, his ex wife and his child. Like, no one called his son. Like, <laughs> um, uh, don't you think if you're like, he could have died, and Billy would have never been able to or say goodbye Jimmy to him, or Freddie, or oh, yeah, or Jerry, I mean, whatever his name they is. Like, they probably would have called the wrong person anyway. Like, hey, Jimmy, and your Bobby dad. has Bobby <laughs> has a new dad now. <laughs> yeah, I guess he doesn't need Croc Crockett anymore, but. I mean, moved other, on. Yeah, he's moved on. <laughs> other than the fact that, like, those are the people, only the people he works with are the people, his parents. Does he have parents? <laughs> For God's sake, does he have a family? <laughs> Did you call his mom and dad? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the guy he plays checkers with? <laughs> yeah. That old man he drinks the Cuban coffees with? You couldn't call him? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was a flimsy storyline. I I mean, I don't mind the flashback. I thought the flashbacks were okay. You know, they did a good job. They picked some good ones, except for the Zito one. That was wrong. Just wrong. <laughs> I don't need to see that again. I've seen it too many times already. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? Uh, you know, every, every TV show has their clip show. It's like the signature show of like, we don't have any more ideas, folks. Half of us <laughs> half the writers are on vacation. Here's something we threw together in about 10 minutes for you. <laughs> so it felt like this. It felt like this maybe took a little more than 10 minutes, so I'll give him a little credit for that. Because there was a storyline here, and it wasn't just long dream sequence or something, you know? Like, there was actually a case that Zwitek worked, and him and Izzy eventually solved. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we'll see that episode later. <laughs> I'm sure there was some wonderful police work done. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, every show has has a clip show, and this is their clip show. And here's a clip of me talking about clip shows. (laughs) (laughs) It's just the same clip over and over again. I (laughs) agree. I agree. So uh, I'm glad we had that clip that I could throw to. So I could throw you to this clip. (laughs) This clip, which I think sums up my final thoughts of the episode. (laughs) <laughs> Here, let's sum it up. Here's the clip. <laughs> oh, All right, man. what do you think, Dominic? It's a clip show. Powerful stuff, know, right? <laughs> Powerful stuff, right? Uh, it really touched me too. <laughs> yeah, I, it's a clip show. I don't know what else to say. I, I surprised it took so long for us to get one. We should have had one like every season at this point, right? But we only get one clip show in the history of Miami Vice. I think it's because they know the end is on the horizon. So, like, we got to do a clip show. <laughs> Remember all this good stuff? My that is, we should have been doing a clip show. <laughs> a good way for us to take some time off. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, heat at gmail.com. Check out that website, goWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us. We had a ton of fun putting this together, doing this show. 
this was it was a clip show we knew that this was not going to be a serious episode so we took every opportunity to have a lot of fun with this episode we hope you enjoyed this one if you enjoyed it email us go with the heat at com. let us know also if you enjoyed it go to your podcast your platform of choice and give us a review give us five stars go ahead just give us five stars no one will even know that i told you to do it there's no evidence on the internet no one will be able to find this but don't write a review no one ever reads the reviews instead write what zito would remember if he was still on the show Go in there, write down the best Zito Crockett moment. We want to see what your favorite Crockett and Zito moments are. Also on that website are other ways that you can support us. Like we said, support number one, email us, support number two, review the show, support number three. Check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat and let us see your support. We have a ton of ideas for where we want to take this show after Miami Vice. And you know what? If you were willing to buy us a beer, if you ran into us, at a bar, and you say, you know what, I really enjoy the show. I'd be willing to buy you a beer. That's about five dollars each. That's fifteen dollars for you if you want to buy us a beer. You can support us for less than that by paying a dollar a month to Patreon and showing your support on Patreon. That's only twelve dollars a year. Dominic's here to help you save money. If you would buy us a beer, that'd be fifteen dollars plus tip on Patreon. It's only twelve dollars. So if you think we're cool enough, you love the show enough that you'd want to buy us a beer if you ran into us out on the street or at a bar, go check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time. This is not a clip or is it? (laughs) I know. The clip. (laughs) 